A great time set aside this morning. What wonderful music. Thank you so much, Miss Teresa, Miss Susie Choir, Miss uh, Nancy. Thank you so much. Just always just a blessing to see how our choir grows each and every Sunday. It's just a wonderful time of praise and worship. And I'm glad that you all were able to be out here this morning. Real quickly, as we look over uh, what we're going to be doing for the next couple weeks, this morning I would like to start a short Two sermon series on the subject of Jesus gives. And Brother Zach can get that up for me. And there you go. Jesus gives. I want to do just, we've got, um, we've got Mother's Day coming up next month. We've got homecoming. We've got Memorial Day. And so that will take up most of the month. So I was, I've been kind of looking at some different series and the Lord laid this one on my heart. Jesus gives. Now, that we have come through Resurrection Sunday, which we just saw last week. We had a great sunrise service and breakfast here. I want us to see that not only did Jesus give his life for us, but that he also gives so much more. Can I get an amen? amen. This morning I want to discuss how Jesus gives living water. Amen. Jesus gives living water. Now, to give us a quick backdrop for this morning's sermon, we need to know a little bit about the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the feast that would take place in Jerusalem. The Feast of Tabernacles is unique in that the Gentile nation were invited to come up to Jerusalem along with the Jewish people to worship the Lord at this appointed time there in Jerusalem. The Lord told Moses to gather all men, women, and children along with the foreigners in their land so they could learn how to fear God. We see that in Deuteronomy 31. So the Feast of Tabernacles was eight days set up for these different feasts that would go on during this time when, when all the diaspora in the Greek, which is the dispersed ones, the ones that lived down in the, the outer lying suburbs, if you would, and they would all come together. They would all come upon Jerusalem. They'd have this great time of feast. Now, now remember we're talking about Jesus gives living water. During the eighth day, which would have been the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the priest would carry these golden pitchers or golden cisterns of water from the Gihon Spring to the temple altar. So they would do this. They would have these, these golden pitchers, and they would go back and forth from the Gihon Spring all the way back up to the altar there at the temple. And then they would pour these pitchers of water out onto the temple. And they would do this all day. They would go back and forth. Now, this ritual reminded them of the water from the rock during the wilderness experience when Moses, we all know in Numbers, when Moses hits the rock and the rock brings forth sustaining water. The, the Israelite children were lost in the wilderness they were there and Moses hits the rock when he should have spoke to the rock, but he hits the rock and the rock was a form of Christ and the rock spews out this life-giving water that helped sustain these people who were, who were thirsting to death and their, their herds of animals were thirsting to death and then water flows out from this big stone that no otherwise would have Water. So they did this. It reminded them of the water in the rock during the wilderness wanderings. But it also spoke prophetically of the coming days of Messiah. This rock was a type of Christ, bringing forth this life giving, life sustaining water. Now, we also know that because of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we no longer have to adhere to the feast days, the feast of tabernacles, or the, the feast of first fruits, or any of these others, because Jesus has fulfilled the law, and Jesus is the feast days. We need to understand that, because you're going to, be, you're going to encounter some of that in your Christian walk people who keep the feast days, but yet call themselves Christians. And that's okay. Some people do that and they have accepted Jesus Christ and they are Christians, but they get caught up in some type of legalism 
where they think that they've got to keep the feast days. They, they, they do it all the time and they keep all these, these rabbinical laws and the laws of Moses and all these things. And we need to understand that Jesus is the feast days. Jesus is the first fruits. Jesus is the feast of tabernacles. Jesus is all these things. Matthew 5, 17 says, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but I have come rather to fulfill them. Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law. I didn't come to do away with the feast days. I came to fulfill it. I am the feast days. I am all these things, all these laws, all these feasts that you keep in remembrance of Moses and the laws. I am that which you have been waiting for. I am the manifestation of these things. Let's take a look this morning of how Jesus gives living water. Turn in your Bibles to the book of John. John chapter 7. It's a nice picture, isn't it? Zach does a good job. Thomas does too, but Zach picked out that picture, so. John chapter 7. We're going to be in verse 37 through 39. And as you find your way there, if you would please stand with me. As we read God's holy, perfect, precious, and authoritative word. John chapter 7. Verse 37 through 39 starts this way and states this, In the last day, the eighth day, that great day of the feast, Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, remember they're bringing these pitchers of water back and forth. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified at this particular time. This is the Word of God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. We honor you. We praise you. We glorify you, Father. We don't want to do anything that does not glorify your name here this morning. We want your Holy Spirit to have rule and reign over this entire time that we spend together. Father, if they be a heart in here that does not know you, Lord God, I would ask you, Father, that you would bring that heart under extreme pressure and conviction this morning. That they would want to reach out to you, as we'll see here in a moment, for your life-giving water. Father, let it not be me that we focus on, Father, but let it be your glorious, life-giving words. Father, for those who are saved in here this morning, Father, I would just ask that you would break their hearts and bring them under conviction for ways that they can serve you deeper, that they can follow you closer. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And you may be seated. If you like to take notes, you can start by writing this down. I want us to pay close attention as we're in this Jesus Gives uh, sermon series. We'll be dealing with blessings next week. We're dealing with the living water this week. So I want us to understand this, that Jesus gives living water for the thirsty. I want you to write that down if you take notes. Jesus gives living water for the thirsty. Follow with me here in verse 37. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried saying, so I just said they were taking the pictures back and forth of the golden pictures full of water from the Gihon Spring to the temple altar. And they'd pour them out and they'd go back and forth, back and forth doing that in remembrance of what happened in the desert. 
which was a type of Christ. This rock was a type of Christ that spewed forth living water. So here Jesus is at the Feast of Tabernacles taking place there in Jerusalem, and he walks up and he sees them going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the Word of God says that Jesus cries out and says, If any man truly thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Quit running these pictures of water back and forth. Don't you understand that the one that you're doing this to remind you of is right here in front of you. If any man thirst, if any man truly has desire and thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Now, looking at this, this is a simple, personal call to salvation. Simple, personal call to salvation. Come and drink. Come and drink. It doesn't get any more simple than that. Jesus cried to the people there in Jerusalem. He says, if you truly thirst, then just come and drink. Jesus is letting us know that he is not only the life-sustaining water that flowed from the rock there in the wilderness, but he is also the living water for us today. Jesus says, I am the manifestation of that in which you do this in remembrance of. He says, and I am what you need for today and forever. He tells us as readers of his word 2,000 years later, I am all that you need. Come and drink me in. I am that which can sustain you. I'm that water that flows from the rock. I am that rock. He says, and this water will sustain you. John 4.14 states this, Whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give, hallelujah, shall never ever thirst again. He tells this to the woman at the well, must needs go through Samaria. He tells this to the woman, he says, he says whoever drinks of the water that I give, the life-giving water that I spew out, whoever drinks of that will never ever thirst again. Jesus is that all-encompassing thirst quencher, right? He's better than Gatorade, baby. Amen? Amen. This verse, I want us to listen to this. This verse is also a call to receive the water, okay? I want us to understand this. We're going to make a little switch here. This verse is also a call not only that Jesus has the water, and that we need to drink the water if we want to be saved. But it's a call to receive the water. No one needs to dig a well. No one needs to go out and, and have the little, the little water tines and try to find out where water is. Nobody needs to dig for it. Just come to Jesus and drink. Amen? That's all we have to do. We don't have to go looking for it. We don't have to find things to fill us up. See, we have a big problem with that. We like to find things to fill up our time, find things to satisfy those deep thirsts that we have, the, that thirstiness that, that we just are always constantly trying to find something that will quench. We don't have to do that. You don't have to dig a well. You don't have to look no further. Jesus says... If you're thirsty, come and drink. Amen? But now listen, as I said, this is also a call to receive the water. There's a caveat here that I want us to pay attention to. The verse says, if any man thirst, if any man thirst, we must be willing to admit that we're thirsty. See, it's a call to receive it as well. Receive this, receive this water. 
I'm calling you to do what it takes to receive this water. How, what do you have to do? It says, well, a man must thirst first. A man must thirst. Are you thirsty? He says, a man must thirst. We must be willing to admit that we are thirsty. Are you thirsty this morning, lost person? If you are, then the Bible says to come and drink. It gets no simpler than that. Are you feeling parched this morning, Christian? Have you been, have you been away from the, the spigot of the living water for too long? Then the day is the day for that wonderful and mighty refill that you need. Jesus says, if you're lost, come and drink. I'm what you need for salvation. If you're saved, I'm what you need to continue to be refilled. Next, write this down. Secondly, Jesus gives living water to those who believe. He gives it to those who thirst Right? We must be willing to thirst. We must admit that we're thirsty. How do we get, when we get saved, we believe on the name of Jesus Christ, and that name has emphasis on it. It means that we, un, that we believe that he died and was buried and rose again on the third day. We have to believe in the gospel. Uh, you know, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus gives living water to those who believe but it's also thirsty. We must want it. Right? You have, it, it, there's lots of people walking around the world today that aren't saved. You have to want it. You hear the word. You come under conviction. You're drawn by the Holy Spirit. And then you reach up and you ask Jesus to save you. That's when you're saying, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. And he says here, Jesus gives living water to those who believe. Look with me at verse 38 real quickly. The Word of God says this, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. I love that. The, be the word belly or heart means the innermost part of your being. In, in the Greek, it, it means uh, when they would talk about it in this period of time, they would talk about your very soul. Your, 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 the yearning of your belly, the yearning of your heart was your innermost desire, innermost yearnings. He says here that he that believeth on me, he that has faith in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, out of his innermost, the deepest place where he desires from will flow rivers of living water. That's good news, amen? He says, if you're thirsty and you have faith and you believe, he says, out of that deep, dark place of your uttermost thirst, he says, can flow living water freely, right? Out of your belly. Now, looking at this, so how can thirsty people receive the living water from Jesus? Well, we must believe on him. John 3, 16 says, For whosoever believes on him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. We know that belief on the gospel, belief on Christ, is that basic that we have to have. When a person believes on Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, this living water saves you. Now listen, this is, this is, I don't just want the, the Christians to tune this out and say, well, I'm already saved. We need to know all this information. If you're in here this morning, God wanted you to hear this. For whosoever believes on him shall not perish. When a person believes on Jesus Christ and all who he is, his death, his burial, his resurrection, that living water comes and saves you. That living water that's pouring out of that rock in the desert as Moses hits that rock and it starts to spew forth living water. These people were half dead. 
These people were thirsting to death. Their cattle were dropping off like flies. They were starving and they were thirsting to death. And all of a sudden, the rivers of living water flowed. They all were able to drink and they all were able to sustain life. His death, burial, and resurrection shows us who he is, and that living water will save you. But, now listen to this. For the Christian, this believing faith that we have, this, this believing Jesus gives living water to those who believe, this believing faith can also replenish and revitalize one who has fell away. Right? We need to understand that. This water's flowing, baby. It's just flowing. I mean, it's, it's a Russian river. And it could revitalize that thirsty Christian. It could revitalize that, that wayward son or daughter who's been away from the well a little too long, starting to dry up a little bit. He says, come and drink the water. One who has found themselves thirsting for that life-giving water. Listen, there's so many Christians out there today that are not in church. They're not living the life that they're supposed to be living. And little do they know that they are absolutely thirsting to death. They don't realize it because they're allowing the devil to cloud their mind, cloud their judgment, and blind them. And all along, they're thirsting to death. They're, they're withering up. And they're going to dry up and blow away if they don't get that replenishing life-giving water. Maybe that's you here this morning. Come back to the well. Come back to the rock. Come back to the Petros, the rock, Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to make this transition here. I want us to see this. The word but be filled should be a continual state of being filled. In the Greek, in, in, in the Word of God, that's what it is. It's a continuous be being filled. For the believer, allowing the living waters to fr flow freely. As believers... We should continually be being filled. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be being filled. Continually as believers, we should be sitting at the well all the time. You know, we should be a little greedy with the water, Brother Mike. Amen. We should be sitting over top of the well, just keep running that bucket up, keep pouring it on us, drinking it down. People holler, whoa, using up all the water. I don't care. It ain't never going to end, baby. He's got more than we can ever drink up, and he wants to continue to flow it out into us. To continuously be being filled is how the believer should live his life. In that continual filled state, allowing the living waters to flow freely. We need to go back to the cross so the Holy Spirit can keep us filled. One of the things that you'll notice is the further you get away from Calvary, the further you get away from God. The further you get away from Calvary, you'll start to notice the less you hear the voice of God. It's time for us to come back to the cross. Come back to where the water is flowing. And understand that Jesus wants to continuously keep you filled. Now, lastly, write this down. This goes along with this. Jesus gives living water by the Holy Spirit. We're looking for this living water. We're looking for this sustaining water in our life, this deep down free-flowing belly of a river that they saw in the desert pouring out of that rock. 
that saved everything. We're looking for that. Jesus says, I give this living water to you through the Holy Spirit. Follow with me. Look at verse 39. <coughs> but this spake he of the Spirit. What's this? He that believeth on me, as the Scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of as of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him shall receive. And it says, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Because Jesus was not yet glorified at this time. But he says that's what he was speaking of when he's talking about these living waters. That's what Christ is talking about when he starts to say, I've got this water I want to give. That's what it was in the wilderness. This water flowing out, it was the Holy Ghost of God coming forth from Jesus. The Holy Spirit is what will sustain us. Jesus gives living water by the Holy Spirit. Now, now that they, now that we are on this side, and we need to understand that, now that we are on this side of the resurrection, we just had Resurrection Sunday last week. Now that we are on this side of the resurrection, we know that Jesus gives something better than water that quenches physical thirst. Jesus gives living water, which is God the Holy Spirit. Now, as you notice, I said God the Holy Spirit. The Trinity. Three in one. On this side of the resurrection, we can understand now that God can give us these things. He quenches not only our physical thirst, but even more our spiritual thirst by giving us the living water, which is God, the Holy Spirit. To all those who accept this living water, understand this. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will come live in you and seal you until the day that he returns for you. When you accept this living water, what you're doing is accepting the Holy Spirit to come and live. When you cry out to Jesus and say, I want your atoning blood to cover my life. I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior. He says he allows the Holy Spirit, the living water, to come inside of you and seal you until the day of redemption, until the day that he returns forever and ever, as long as it takes. As we close, dear ones, I want us to understand a few things. We need to understand that if we are thirsty, Jesus says he has the only water that can quench the deepest thirst. He's the only one that can do it. I'm telling you right now, there's many of you maybe out here, and we've got a smaller crowd than usual this morning, but I'm still sure it's a big enough crowd. We've got things in our lives that we're using to see us through, to help us. I know I do. I, I rely on things. You rely on things. Jesus says, I want to be that sustaining water for you. I want to be all that you need. I want to be that which quenches your thirst. The problem is, is so many times we thirst for things that God doesn't approve of. And we start to wander out in this world in the desert. And all along, God wants us to stay close to him so he can give us what we need. But we go out thirsting for things of this world. God says, I've got that which will quench your thirst. All these other things are just going to get you by for a day or two. Sin is pleasurable for a season, the Bible says. We'll try to fill up those holes with sex, drugs, partying, whatever, gambling, pornography, whatever it is. We'll try to fill those deep, dark holes. Jesus says, what that hole is, is a thirst. 
It's just a deep thirst. He says, and I'm the only one that can quench it. Christian, if you have been feeling run down and ragged, everything you need is already inside of you. We just have to go back to the cross and go back to the fountain. Okay? So understand this, lost person, you need to come to the cross for salvation. Christian is feeling run down and ragged. You need to go back to the cross. You need to go back to the fountain. You need to go back to the water spigot and get refilled because here's the deal. And I, I saw this, a scholar had wrote this a couple weeks ago. I was looking at this. You haven't lost anything. Everything you need is inside of you. The day that you were saved, the full power of God came inside of you, the Holy Spirit. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power that raised Lazarus from the dead, the same power that parted the Red Sea so Moses and the Israelites could cross and get in front of Pharaoh's army, that power resides in you. It's there now. The problem that we run into is that the power is most powerful when we're close to God. That's when we have our power, when we're abiding in Christ. Those who walk in darkness but say that they have light are liars and do not the truth, 1 John tells us. We have to abide in Christ and that power is there. Everything you need, Christian, this morning is already inside of you. You just need to go back to the cross. You need to go back to the fountain and just let that fountain well up inside. Let Jesus manifest that which is already inside of you and just start to bubble it over again. Maybe that's what you're missing. Christians need to humble themselves, get on their knees, repent, and let God know that you are thirsty. One of the biggest problems we have as Christians is our pride. We walk around not wanting anybody to know we're in trouble. Not wanting, not, walking around not wanting anybody to know that, that, that we have fallen in this way or that way. Too dad burn prideful to walk an aisle at a church, to come to an old fashioned altar like this one, to reach out to a deacon or a pastor or a saint and say, hey, I need to talk, I'm, I'm in a bad way. We're too flipping prideful to do that. We need to humble ourselves, get on our hands and knees and let God know that we're thirsty so we can come and drink. That's what he wants us to do. If you're unsaved here this morning, remember, Jesus is the only one who gives the water that you are thirsting for. Call on his name and be saved. That's all it takes. Call on the name of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a theology scholar to be saved. All you have to know is that you're a sinner in need of a savior. Call on his name. Ask him to cover you with his life-giving blood and tell him how thirsty you are. And he will allow the Holy Spirit to come in and seal your life. And you'll have all the power you ever need residing inside of you. Amen? Please stand if you would.